This is the big picture, an official television report of the United States Army, produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Master Sergeant Stuart Quaid. On 17 August 1955, Executive Order 10631 was signed by President Eisenhower. It was a rather unusual executive order and states in part, by virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States, I hereby prescribe the code of conduct for members of the Armed Forces of the United States. This code of conduct today is found throughout the world, wherever our armed forces are stationed. The code is dramatically presented by a series of six posters. How these posters came into being is the first story on the big picture today. On every bulletin board, in every service installation. The serviceman's code of conduct, set into simply and clearly worded articles by order of the president, it serves as both a reminder and a guide. A reminder of how the American under arms has conducted himself in the past when fallen into enemy hands. A guide enabling today's fighting man to live up to the same high principles of devotion to duty, should that misfortune be his own lot. Stressing the importance that Uncle Sam attaches to the code, your Department of Defense has put into practice an age-old precept. One picture is worth a thousand words. Posters carrying the meaning of an entire paragraph are to punch home the code's all-important six articles. To create these colorful posters, the services of the entire membership of the Society of American Illustrators have been enlisted. The society includes the country's best-known artists. You've seen their work on the covers of the countless magazines that line our newsstands and find their way into our libraries and our homes. Within these publications, their familiar styles engage our interest and enliven the stories they illustrate. We are privileged to see some of these top flight craftsmen at work. Here is Hardy Gramatke. And his artist's colony neighbor, Alex Ross, both of whom entered the poster contest sponsored by the Department of Defense. Steve Dohanis, best known for his Saturday evening post covers, is another of the 400 contestants. Tom Lovell, who within a few months will find himself among the lucky six to win a first award. And Harold von Schmidt, whose own words sum up the sincerity and dedication with which each of these artists approached his work. I'm interested in a part of the code which deals with resisting the enemy by all means available. First thing that came to my mind was someone in our own history, one whom we all know, was arrested, continued to resist. Nathan Hale, you remember his famous statement, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. That's a perfect statement. 21 years old when he died. Yet this was what he was willing to do. Puts him in mind of what someone said. He who dies for his country has lived long enough. The showing of the finished canvases was staged in Washington on the Pentagon's main concourse. There, the Department of Defense's announcement was appropriately framed by the figure of a Continental rifleman, the first serviceman to know the sacrifices expected of an American prisoner of war. With this turnout of talent, it was no easy task to select the poster which would best illustrate the spirit behind each of the Code 6 articles.
A committee of judges, selected from officials of the Department of Defense and the service arms, was hard put to arrive at a choice. Since the goal was to see that one complete set of winning posters should reach every point on the globe where Americans are stationed, the final selection was only a first step in the Defense Department's program. The top award winners must now be handed over to one of the nation's best known lithograph companies, there to be reproduced as finished posters. A big job, and fittingly enough, the biggest camera in this country is used to make photographic plates of the chosen canvases. Skilled craftsmen and the final word in lithographic machinery will now speed an endless flow of colorful placards to their ultimate destination. Every point in the world where an American serves, a gigantic project to achieve an all-important goal. Wherever they appear, they will remind the serviceman that continued devotion to country is expected even should he be disarmed and fall into the hands of his enemies. I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender my men while they still have the means to resist. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am bound to give only name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. I will never forget that I am an American fighting man, responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. The code of conduct posters stretch around the world, from Germany to Japan and back to the United States. And it is in these three countries that our next three big picture stories take place. One story called Operation Red Corpuscle is a story of giving. It concerns an entire company of men stationed in Germany and how they, as a unit, gave their blood that others might live. Another story takes place in Japan. It is about milk and how this nourishing liquid, taken for granted here at home, reaches our army personnel 5,000 miles away in the Far East. The third story starts in the United States. 
and is really unfinished, for the leading characters may soon find themselves serving in the most remote corners of the world. This is the story of the men who are learning to operate your army's newest source of power, derived from the atomic reactor. Nuremberg, Germany, and the first of our next three stories, Operation Red Corpuscle. Nuremberg is the home of the United States 5th Infantry Regiment while they are stationed in Germany. Recently, all the men of the 5th Heavy Mortar Company volunteered to donate one pint of blood each to the U.S. Army Blood Bank at Landstuhl, Germany. Meanwhile, out on the hospital helicopter landing pad, two big whirly birds settle down. They are carrying the blood bank chests from Landstuhl here to this hospital in Nuremberg. It's a lot easier than bringing the whole company to the blood bank. The regimental band, and they're playing a welcome march as the buses roll onto the hospital grounds. Single file, the men walk into the hospital where a preliminary physical exam is given to all of them before they can give their pint of blood. Each man's blood pressure is taken to ensure he's up to par. Then a sample is taken to determine the type of blood each donor has and to ensure that his blood will clot correctly. It's only blood, but some fellows just can't stand the sight of it. Having passed the physical exam, each man prepares for the actual process of donating. If the palms are a little sticky at this point, that's perfectly understandable. It's really just the idea that is sometimes hard to get used to. Actually, the process of blood donating is not painful, and your body replaces the lost blood in just a few hours' time. So really, you're only lending the pint. You get it back so quickly. But the fellow on the other end, he's going to be pretty thankful for that little plastic bag of life when it gets pumped back into his arm. When full, the plastic bag contains one pint of human blood, 91% water, and yet so precious that it holds the key to survival for many a hospital patient. The bag of blood must be placed in a refrigerated blood chest immediately after being filled or the red corpuscles will start to die. An average man has about six quarts of blood constantly circulating throughout his system. This blood brings food and oxygen to his body cells and fights infection. It's every man's own personal transportation and defense system. That's why it's so important to have blood stored ready for the individual emergencies that happen every day. That's why these men have given their blood that others may live. And after donating, free chow for all to help replace those red blood corpuscles. Now, that wasn't really so bad, was it, fellows? As the men of the heavy mortar company get ready to return to their regular duties, 
the chests of fresh whole blood are wheeled out to the waiting helicopters. Much heavier now than when they arrived, each carries the gift of life to those who will soon need it. A gift donated by a company of men from the 5th Infantry Regiment in Germany during an incident called Operation Red Corpuscle. In Yokohama, Japan, your army supervises an unusual operation. This is the Blue Seal Dairy, run by the International Dairy Supply Company, under contract from the Department of the Army. The dairy makes liquid milk and other dairy products from dry solids shipped from the United States. Here, a truck of skim milk is unloaded at the dairy plant. Inside, trained Japanese personnel open the sealed containers and empty them into a hopper for mixing with other ingredients. This is the first step in the recombining process to make fluid milk. From the hopper, the dry solids are mixed with anhydrous milk fats and purified water. Though run by the International Dairy Supply Company and operated by Japanese personnel, U.S. Army specialists are always in evidence around the plant, for constant inspection is the key to a high-quality product. Pasteurization temperature is 162 degrees Fahrenheit, and it must be accurately maintained. Once recombined and pasteurized, the now fluid milk is ready for packaging. This is the Pure Pack machine. Semi-automatic in operation, it waxes, fills, and seals the full containers. The filled cartons are placed in cases and kept under refrigeration until shipped. But every day before milk is shipped, samples are taken for testing. A bacteria count is made and the butterfat content checked. The tests ensure that the milk is pure and that it has the same nutritional ingredients as natural whole milk. But the proof of the pudding is still in the eating and the taste test is the final criteria. This man-made product is almost indistinguishable from fresh country milk. Another product of the Blue Seal Dairy is an American favorite, ice cream. Vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, whatever your choice is, it's sure to be produced. Here is ice cream by the bucket as bulk containers are filled by modern continuous supply machines. Then into the freezer. Here's how popsicles are made. Under the watchful eye of an army veterinarian, the forms are filled with the popsicle mixture and then leveled off. Next, the forms are placed in a brine tank to freeze. At the other end, the forms get steamed off. And presto, popsicles. Cottage cheese is another product of the Blue Seal Dairy. Here the cheese, already in the vat, is cross-cut before cooking. Next, the liquid whey is drained out the bottom of the vat. Now 
Now the cheese is trenched and allowed to set for about an hour before being placed in the hopper of the packing machine. And there you have it, cottage cheese, just like you buy it back home. To have these things that are commonplace back home, that is the purpose of the Blue Seal Dairy. To make available at the commissary store all those foods that American servicemen and their dependents like so much. To make being so far away a little more like home. But it can never be exactly the same. And should you want sour cream, for instance, you've got to mix your own. But throughout Japan, whether it's in the commissary store, the post exchange snack bar, or in the chow line of a mess hall, the products of the Blue Seal Dairy are much in evidence. Just one more way your army makes life overseas a little closer to the life these men have known at home. There is a new shape on the face of the earth. It is the shape of things to come. For this is a prototype atomic power reactor at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. It can produce electricity for a good-sized town for more than a year on a single charge of nuclear fuel. This ability to operate for long periods on a few pounds of fuel will save your army millions of dollars in transportation costs and solve many pressing problems in logistics. But right now, the problem is to train men to run the reactor. The University of Virginia was selected for the first inter-service training course. Founded in 1817 by Thomas Jefferson, the university has long been a respected seat of higher learning. Here in this traditional setting, 30 men in Mufti from the Army, Navy and Air Force have come to learn how an atomic power plant works. These men have been selected for their high IQ and engineering background. The course here is 22 weeks and includes such subjects as mathematics, physics, and mechanical, electrical, and nuclear engineering. Geometry, trigonometry, and calculus were once familiar to all these men, but that may have been some time ago. Now, with the help of the instructor, it all comes back. Nuclear physics and engineering, right here, in the classroom is where the theory is taught. This is the why of atomic power. The how will come later when these men start their laboratory work. The campus is beautiful. And though the men may stop and look for a moment, they are all beginning careers in an entirely new and exciting field. And even on a break, the books are opened and the mysteries of the atom discussed. It's a five and a half day week here with 22 hours of classes and many more of supervised study. Much of the classroom time is spent in the laboratory, for here is where all the physics and mathematics theory materializes into the meters and switches that control the atomic power output. The students not only observe, but also learn by doing. For they'll have to be familiar with every operation here when they start to run an atomic power plant on their own. The nuclear fission that takes place in an atomic reactor must be closely monitored and very carefully controlled. It will be up to these men to confine the reaction so that the power level never exceeds certain limits. Fully aware of the responsibilities of their future assignment, the students burn a good deal of the midnight oil preparing themselves. 
all have at least four more years of obligated military service. But all know that theirs is going to be the kind of experience that will make them valuable men, whatever their future career. Their enthusiasm for the program is evident, as they tell us in their own words. The nuclear power program is one of the new fields of endeavor in the armed forces. This opportunity of receiving this training here at the University of Virginia will advance me in the Army in a new career. The training that I am receiving here at the University, combined with my past experience in steam and uh, hydro power plants, will enable me to be a superintendent of a nuclear power plant. I believe that there will be many similar positions in this field in the future. The men here studying with me, the enlisted personnel and officers, are not only bettering themselves in the service and for the service, but they will increase the efficiency of the Army, Navy, and Air Force and make it a most modern military organization. We are completing a course here at the University of Virginia in nuclear power. Together with this academic training and with the practical experience that we shall receive, we shall be able to train other people and to operate nuclear electric power and heating plants at remote installations uh, throughout the uh, world. At Fort Belvoir, putting theory learned at the university to work, two of the students select a rod of enriched uranium-235. It is sheathed in stainless steel for protection. These rods are the fuel for the nuclear reactor. Now the students practice charging up the atomic furnace of the prototype reactor. The force of a nuclear reaction is controlled by changing the positions of these rods. The utmost caution must be exercised. In the control room, watchful eyes make sure that all is well. With everything checked and functioning properly, the tension eases, and these men can take pride in the knowledge that they are among the few selected to master the power of the atom and put it to useful purpose. Of the United States to Germany, Japan, and back, the traveling camera crews of the big picture have recorded various scenes of your Army's activities around the world. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your Army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is an official television report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station.